with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever loves me will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Yet the word you hear is not mine, but that of the Father who sent me. I have told you this while I am with you. The Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have told you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. You heard me tell you, I am going away and I will come back to you if you love me. You would rejoice that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it happens, so that when it happens, you will believe. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. Arguments start. Somebody says something and maybe it's misinterpreted and the fight begins. The verbal back and forth begins. And uh, I discovered a, just a small list of how that can happen, just a few items of how little things can be said and maybe misinterpreted. Um, uh, one of these is uh, my wife sat down on the couch next to me as I was flipping channels. She asked, what's on TV? I said, dust. No. And then the fight started. My wife was hinting about what she wanted for our upcoming anniversary. She said, I want something shiny that goes from zero to 150 in about three seconds. I bought her a scale. And then the fight started. I asked my wife, where do you want to go for our anniversary? She said, somewhere I haven't been in a long time. I suggested, how about the kitchen? <laughs> and then the fight started. A woman was looking in the mirror. She was not happy with what she sees and says to her husband, I feel horrible. I look old, fat, and ugly. I really need you to pay me a compliment. The husband replies, well, your eyesight is totally perfect. <laughs> and then the fight started. <laughs> the disciples from Judea were introducing the Gentiles to the good news. Faith in Jesus, the miracle worker who has risen from the dead, welcoming them into this new and exciting group of followers. The Jewish Christians said, don't forget about the Mosaic Covenant you got to get circumcised first. And then the fight started. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened in the first reading today. If you uh, look at the Missalette, you'll find that that uh, beginning of that chapter of Acts of the Apostles has verse 1 and 2, and then the fight started. And then it goes to verse 22. There's 20 verses missing in today's reading. That was the fight. Okay, because the Jewish community followers, the Jewish people who have converted to Christianity were bringing the Mosaic Law with them. And so part of the Mosaic Law was circumcision. And so it started a controversy. Now, which parts of the Mosaic Law are we going to keep and which aren't we going to keep? And the, the Jews want to hold on to the old law and introduce the new law. The Gentiles say, oh, wait a minute now, let's not go too far with this. And so uh, Paul and Barnabas met with Peter and the apostles in Jerusalem, and it was the first council of the church. And the item was <laughs> circumcision. Do we mandate this for all of new 
uh, Gentiles that are not part of the Jewish or the Mosaic Covenant. So it was quite a controversy. Um, and uh, sometimes I feel that maybe the reason that um, uh, you know, all the centuries have gone by with the church being ruled by males is maybe the fear that they never want to revisit that question and maybe get an alternative answer. <laughs> so because the first council of Jerusalem said, this is one uh, part of the Mosaic law that you don't have to adhere to, relax. And so um, there was a peacefulness that was brought about by by this decision so that the Gentiles felt much more comfortable, much more at ease entering into this profession of Christianity. Now in the Gospel reading, peace that Jesus is giving us and inviting us to is a little different. Okay? It's not the worldly peace that we hear about in Acts of the Apostles, nor is it the kind of peace that we, I think, see most of the time in our world, in our society today. Jesus' peace has three components to it. The peace that he offers us is positive, it's proactive, and it's personal. I say it's positive because if we look at the kind of peace that we see in the Acts of the Apostles, or the kind of peace we see in our world today, it's usually in a negative way. Okay? Which means it's the absence of war. A peace treaty doesn't say that people are reconciled. It doesn't say that people are at peace. It just says that we're not fighting. Okay? The, in, in the Acts of the Apostles, the kind of peace that the church felt at that time wasn't that everybody was happy because some of the Jews probably expected the Mosaic Covenant to, to hold them together. And so it wasn't a win-win situation exactly, but it was a... I'm kind of a negative piece being we're not going to fight. Not necessarily that we're going to get along like we really agree with everything, but we're not going to fight. So there's a negative piece, if you will. But Jesus' peace is not negative. It's a positive energy because it's coming from a place of love, not from a place of negotiation. It's fully given it is fully inviting people to a peace that comes from nothing but pure self-surrender, pure love. So that's a different kind of peace than we're used to, and even a different kind of peace that the church experienced in the first century. Secondly, I mentioned that it's proactive. Now that's very different too, because the peace that we see in the world is reactive. Meaning, when there's been enough bloodshed, let's stop this when um, there's been a constant conflict between labor and management. Let's come to the table. There's been enough argument, okay? Uh, so it's all reaction, too. When enough life has been lost and enough blood has been shed, now let's react to this and come up with a peace. See how that is reactive? Where Jesus says, I give you my peace. I take the initiative. I will be proactive. His peace is not reactive to a situation, like again in the early church, let's get these Jews and Gentiles to get along. That's a reaction to a controversy. Jesus' peace is proactive. I give this to you freely. And then thirdly, it's personal. And as again we see in the world today, most of the peace that we experience is societal, just like it was in the early church. Okay, we had groups of people that weren't getting along, and so this group had to negotiate how they were going to go forward as a Christian church. When we see gangs call a truce, when we see you know, nations sign peace treaties, we're talking about large segments of society. Not everybody agrees with this, not everybody likes it, some will feel like winners, some will feel like losers. It is certainly not a unifying type of peace. But the peace Jesus is talking about in John's Gospel today is, I give my peace to you, 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 you. <coughs> Very personal, one-on-one. -on -one. So personal, he says, the Father and I will dwell in you. See how personal that is? It's not about the church at large. It's not about society. But it is, it is very personal as well as proactive as well as positive. 
So I think maybe our challenge today might be, okay, what do we do with this positive, proactive, and personal invitation to peace? Can we extend that to somebody else? We had a general absolution this morning, so I'm going to challenge you as I challenge myself. Um, is there a person in my life that I may need to extend the kind of peace that Jesus is extending to me? Now, I have to keep it real. Jesus didn't say reconciliation. He didn't say, I'm going to offer this peace because we're going to be great buddies. Okay? But he said, I offer you a peace that's positive, proactive, and personal, but not necessarily that's going to reconcile and totally unify us. So as you look in, in your lives, I look in my lives, is there that person? Is that, that one annoying, irritating family member? Okay, is, or if you're like me, you may have to go through a list, to, you know, to pick one. But whatever your challenge may be, can you take Christ's invitation to new light, new hope, new peace, make it your own, let it reside within your heart, and then not expecting or even attempting anything larger Anything like reconciliation and total unity, but can you offer somebody a piece that is personal and proactive and positive? At this Eucharist, we receive the body and blood of Christ that unifies us in peace. Accept that this morning. Let it reside within your spirit, within your egos, within your souls, as I will in mine. And let us proceed to build his kingdom, truly a kingdom of love and a kingdom of peace.